time that we have this morning, we want to turn to the word of the Lord. And last week we, we spoke about, um, I'll come back to the title in just a minute. We started with this verse. We're still, we're, we're still talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to be changing directions fairly soon, but not yet. So, uh, and this was our theme verse uh, last week, Acts 10, 38, how God, this is from the, the message that Peter preaches to the Gentiles who are gathered in the house of Cornelius, um, and this is the second great outpouring of the Holy Spirit for the first time to people who are not Jewish in any way, miraculous. Um, and so part of Peter's message is how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Why does God anoint? Why why was he anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power? That he could go about and do good and bring God's healing, curing all, curing, making whole, we talked about that, all who are under the tyranny, oppression, pressure, any of those words, of the devil, because God was with him. Uh, people get mixed up sometimes in church. They look at power and think, oh, power, power. In God's hands, power is always for a purpose. It's always for a purpose, isn't it? There's a reason. There's a reason for it. Uh, remember when Philip goes to, to uh, the, uh, in Samaria and, uh, the, and Simon sees what he's doing. He was a, a sorcerer. He was a... a, a in, in some cultures, you'd say he was an abelario, or you'd say he was a witch doctor. <laughs> you would. That's what you'd say, right? All mixed up. Or he was a, a witch doctor or, or something like that. And Simon sort of believes, and he, but what we see is we look at that. We'll, maybe we'll look at that at another time. You all are familiar with that story, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, that's in, ac in, in Acts uh, 8 and then going into, into 9, uh, especially in Acts 8. And Simon is really impressed with the power displayed that he sees, right? He's really impressed. Wow. And he says to Peter and John, give me some of that power. So he didn't understand from whence the power came. But more importantly, he did not understand the reason and the purpose, one of the reasons and one of the purposes for which God gives his power and his power flows. And it is to set people free from the tyranny of the devil. If you are under the tyranny of the devil in some way in your life or in your family this morning, God, the Holy Spirit, is at work and is here to set you free, to set me free to bring healing, to restore, to bring order out of chaos, to bring light in darkness, to bring hope where there has been hopelessness. That's one, that's one of the main reasons the power of God is at work. And there's another reason we've not talked about so much, but we will in the, in the weeks ahead. God, the Holy Spirit, works in power not just through us, but in our lives to make us like Jesus as well, to transform us, because we can be as good as we want, but we can't make ourselves like Jesus, and we can't make ourselves holy, although we have all tried, haven't we? Haven't you, haven't you tried to make yourself holy? I'm going to be good, and that lasted a day and a half, maybe, maybe. The power of the Holy Spirit works in our lives to do in us what we cannot do in ourselves, but which God wants for us and plans for us. And that gives me, and it should give you hope, because here's God's standard, and it's just impossible, isn't it? It's just impossible. God, I can't. We feel so hopeless sometimes. And God says, I know you can't, and that is why I give you my Holy Spirit.
to be and to do in you all that I have for you. Romans 8, 26. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And so God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and curing all who were under, making whole all who were under the oppression of the devil because God was with him and God is with us. What does Jesus say his, to his disciples? You wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit and then what does he say? I am with you always. I am with you always. We looked at this. Jesus says, I assure you. When Jesus said, whenever you read in the New Testament, I assure you, uh, different translations will say different things. It's important. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's a, a proclamation of certainty. It's a proclamation on which you can depend. I assure you, I promise you, it's for sure. The one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works in greater multitude than these because I'm going to the Father. And what they didn't understand, but what he meant was, I'm going to the Father, and the Father and I are going to send the Holy Spirit. And then this incredible thing that I'm saying to you right now, this incredible thing will become true in you and through you because the Holy Spirit will be sent. Big amen. <laughs> really, big amen. So last week, we looked at these two ordinary guys, right? This is Acts chapter 6. And uh, these two ordinary guys uh, who were called to be kind of the first deacons of the church, the first servants of the church. Uh, the church was growing. Whenever a church grows, there are always problems. Th those are great problems. You know, to have church problems because of growth, yes, yes. Um, and uh, uh, the church, there, anyhow, there are problems in the church, and the apostles say, we need help. And I want you to think about this. Uh, remember what the apostles say, Acts uh, chapter 6. They say, it's not right for us to stop the ministry we're doing and to wait on the tables. In other words, to handle benevolence, to make sure widows get food, to make sure poor people are fed, uh, to make sure the gifts of food that they get distributed. They said, you choose seven who have good reputation, um, because everybody's going to have to to trust them, who uh, are full of the Holy Spirit. Ah, got to be full of the Holy Spirit because you're 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 working with people, you're serving people, and wisdom. They they're going to have to make good decisions, and um, and so they choose seven, and then we meet these two guys. We we get all seven names. We only meet two of them again. And the two are Stephen and Philip. And then a few chapters, we, we hear about Stephen and Philip. And I want you to, don't worry. I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> Whosoever will open the door to me, I will come in. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Oh, I know what it is. The bar is renovating. I hope it's because they ran out of money or something and <laughs> had bad business. But anyhow, God loves them too. I, I want you to think about this. So here are the apostles, I mean, so full of power, wisdom, all of these things, and yet they say, choose seven people to do this. Have you thought before, who would do the best job of waiting on the tables? The apostles or these seven that were chosen? Of course, the seven. Of course, the seven that are chosen. Why? Because God is calling them and equipping them to do this work which is encouraging to me, and it should encourage you as well. God calls you and equips you for certain things. And you say, well, what is it? Well, I don't know. First of all, if you're not yet in a relationship with God, there's no way to know what that is because God doesn't give you those gifts until you begin a relationship with him. But when you do begin a relationship with him, God gives you gifts for his church because he really loves his church so very much and he wants to help the church. So um, so they begin uh, to serve the tables and we meet these two very ordinary people, our title today, and we this is part, I should have gone ahead and put part one. I already know it's going to be part one. Ordinary people, extraordinary God, okay? Ordinary people, extraordinary God. And uh, these two guys, Philip and Stephen, are ordinary 
But then we read uh, very, very quickly, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. We thought he was just waiting on tables, but God begins to use him. And if you and I, sometimes I, I talk with people, it's like, I, I really want God to use me. I want to be used by God. And I hope that's a desire in all of our hearts. We look at this and we think, wow, may I say, if you will say yes to God and serve God where you are, what you can do right now in small things, God will keep using you and he will move you and grow you into more. That's how God does it. He, he does. That's how God does it. So we meet Stephen, who seems to be an ordinary guy, but then there's an extraordinary God, and then we see this. And then, last week we looked at Philip, right? Uh, by the way, Philip is a Greek name. Do you know what it means? I don't know what Stephen means. Does it, Stephen, what does your name mean? Uh, I used to know. I should have looked at it. Oh, wait, there's another Stephen. Roy, what does Stephen mean? Never mind. He scratches his head, too. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get back to you. Philip is a Greek name. And it means lover of horses. Not very spiritual, but anyhow. It means lover of horses, okay? So these two ordinary people, but they are connected with an extraordinary God. We looked at this last time. Philip went to the city of Samaria. We read this. He told the people there about the Messiah. Now, notice that he doesn't start preaching signs and miracles and wonders and power. He start, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about, notice the word that it uses, Messiah. What does Messiah mean? The anointed one who has been sent, is anointed by God, sent, sent from God, the anointed one. Anointed, why was Jesus anointed? Mm, to go about and do good and to make whole all those who are under the oppression of the enemy. And so that's who Philip talks about. That's who Philip proclaims. Verse 6, when the crowds heard Philip, ah, and then saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. So he was this ordinary guy, but we see extraordinary things. And then dramatically, but this is part of the, the true Bible story, with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many who had been paralyzed or were crippled were healed. And then that lovely verse, so there was great joy in that city. You know what? When Jesus works, there is great joy. There's great joy. Amen. Think of you, uh, maybe, maybe most of you or all of you this morning have begun a relationship with God. Do you remember when you first began a relationship with God? There, I trust there was great joy. There should have been. There should have been. And if this morning you say, I don't, not, not really, I, I don't really, then come talk to me. Because when we begin a relationship with God and he takes care of our sin, and makes us right with him and brings peace into our heart. There's an, all, there's an overflow of joy. That's just part of it. That's just part of it. So, um, so there was great joy in that city. Now, we're going we're gonna to switch. I can already tell we're not going to get very far. That's okay. So here we are. Think with me. Here's Philip. He's in this city of Samaria. Um, uh, when that says city of Samaria, it's not the, that the city is called Samaria. It's a city that is in Samaria. So it'll be quite, it, I think it'd be quite large. And there's this big revival going on. Now, we're not going to look at the story, but if you follow the story through, right after this, John and Peter hear that God's doing great things, right? So they come up from Jerusalem, and then they pray for people to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in the sa and, uh, and they pray and lay hands on them and the same thing happens to these people in Samaria in Samaria that happened to those people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost same thing same thing uh, except no sound of wind no fire but um, it's very very uh, when you read it the the it, it's very clear so God moves again, and he keeps his promise again here. Now, if I were Philip, I would want to stay in this city. There's a big revival going on, right? It's exciting. All sorts of things are happening. 
Peter and John have prayed for them. They've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. God's doing wonderful things. And then Peter and John go back to Jerusalem. And then look at what happens to uh, Philip, okay? As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. Gaza. Okay? I did not include a map reluctantly. I wanted to. But anyhow, it's about 100 miles from where he is. And I want you to pause and think about that for just a minute. Um, I have a question. I don't know if you have an answer. I don't have a full answer for this. Philip is up here and there's a big revival. Peter and John are there. They go back to Jerusalem. Peter and John are very close, relatively close to this place because they've already gone back to Jerusalem. Why? does an angel of the Lord tell Philip to go there? Why not let Philip stay where this big revival is going on? Let Peter and John take care of this. God's doing something special. Let me ask you something. Have you ever felt God direct you to do something and you thought, why? Huh? Why? I don't understand. That doesn't make sense. Wouldn't it be better to whatever? God always has a purpose. God always has a plan. And God chooses Philip. I think God chose Philip because, this is my idea. I haven't read it somewhere. It's my idea. Don't want to preach false doctrine, but this is what I think. Here's Philip. And I think Philip is very open to doing whatever God says to do. I, I really do. Because he goes up to Samaria, and Jews hated Samaritans. Ah, oh, they're dogs. They call them dogs. They're dirty. They're this. They're that. But Philip goes up to Samaria in the same way that Jesus had gone through Samaria to reach a Samaritan woman who was very sinful. And Philip was doing the works that he had seen G that, that Jesus had done. Philip didn't see Jesus do that, but he was doing the works that Jesus had done. And I'm not saying that Peter and John were out of line or weren't listening, but what I am saying is, here's this man, Philip, who's very obedient. He really is. And so he goes to this group of people that most Jews wouldn't go to. And then an angel says, now go down here. I was thinking about that and just meditating on that um, because he goes from a, a, a revival of many and he's now going to meet how many people? Now he's going to minister to how many? To one. To one, right? Does that remind you of any story in John chapter 4? That's right. Here's Jesus. Many people coming gathering around him and Jesus says we've got to go and he goes through he says we've got to go to Samaria we've got to go through Samaria and there's Jesus crowds around him and instead he says now we've got something else to do and he leads his disciples to a city Sychar and there's a woman who's drawing water from the well and Jesus meets her and she is a woman broken. I, I've told you before, I think she was probably very beautiful. I, I, I really do. I think she was. Um, she had five husbands and was living with someone. Uh, I, th I, I think she was beautiful. I think, I think she would have been very appealing and very attractive. Um, if she had been rich, she wouldn't have needed a husband. Got it, right? She wouldn't have needed a husband. She would have had the finances. I think she was beautiful. But those things did not satisfy. And Jesus meets this woman who is totally broken. She probably doesn't look broken on the outside. She probably doesn't look messed up on the outside. Kind of like us sometimes, right? Kind of like us. We look, we look really good on the outside. Most of us. Ah, you all look good. <laughs> you all are handsome and beautiful. I I it's true. And we sometimes come and we gather it, uh, with, our, with our brothers and our sisters. But we're really, really broken inside. We're hurting inside. We're, we're needy inside. And I want you to know that Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, has time for you 
and desires to meet with you and have an appointment with you and meet your need and satisfy your heart and heal your brokenness and quench your thirst. That's what he did for this woman at the well. And then we see Philip. Don't you think that's true, by the way? I think that's true. Don't you think that? I'm pretty sure. And so the, the, an angel says, Philip, go down there. He doesn't question. And he says, go south, uh, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza, about 100 miles. And I, I love this. So simple. So he got up and went. <laughs> I, don't you wish? I, I'll bet God wishes that we would be just like that. God prompts us. I got it. <laughs> so, so we got up and went. And um, there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and a high official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem, and he was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. So he's very educated. Uh, this says there was an Ethiopian man who did a fair bit of, of reading and studying. Some people think that maybe he was Jewish, but he was living in Ethiopia because Jews had been scattered, and this may have been from the time of Solomon. But a lot of others believe this was an ethnically Ethiopian man, a black man, um, who was serving at the highest levels. At, he was a eunuch, which would have been necessary. That's what would have been done and a high official of the queen of the Ethiopians. So I, I tend to think that he, wa he was, that he was, I think probably he was a black man and he was a eunuch. For a Jewish person, this would not be, uh, this, is not, this would not be somebody with whom they would associate very much. But he's already been talking to Samaritans. And so the angel says, go talk to him. He's been in, he'd come to worship in Jerusalem. He had not come to worship Jesus. Who was he worshiping? The God of the Old Testament. All he knew was the Old Testament. He did not know about Jesus. He did not know about grace. He did not know about God's mercy. All he knew was God's law. But that had touched his heart. And so Philip sees. And the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. Philip ran over, heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? And the man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. Brothers and sisters, there are people all around you, all around you and all around me. I'd like to call God. There are people all around us that are just like this Ethiopian eunuch. Think about it this way. We look at this, and it's this wonderful encounter on the road. But I look at this also, and I think this is so sad. It's so sad because here's this man that has come hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. If he, th There's the possibility that he'd come from one other. He might have come from an area around Yemen, but most believe it really was from the area of Ethiopia. He would have traveled for more than a month to get to Jerusalem. He came to Jerusalem. He was worshiping. He was doing the best he knew to do. But look at him. Look at him. He still is hungry. He still does not understand. He still has not met Jesus. There are people around you who are just as empty, just as hungry, and just as searching as this Ethiopian man. And the Holy Spirit wants to whisper to you, go run beside their chariot. Go run beside their chariot. And so Philip does. And, he's, and he urges Philip to come up in the carriage and sit with him. Uh, I, as I was thinking about this, uh, and so he begins to talk with him. I'm not going to look at all of it. Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this scripture, he was reading from Isaiah, uh, um, uh, near the suffering servant. He was, uh, um, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. It had to have been good news. 
Uh, in Jerusalem, what he'd heard was, keep the law. In Jerusalem, what he'd, what he'd heard was, give a sacrifice. And think about this. I am sure, he's an Ethiopian eunuch, he was educated and he would have had great resources. He would have given the full extent of burnt offerings and lambs and all of those offerings that would have been slaughtered on the altar, the blood poured out according to the law. And now, brothers and sisters, here on a du dirty, dusty, isolated road going near Gaza, he hears for the first time that there's a Lamb of God who has been sacrificed for his sins. There's a Lamb of God who was slain once for all time. It's not so that he'd have to go back to Jerusalem and give an, and next time he could make it and, and, and give a sacrifice at the altar. But Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, had been given and his sacrifice was good for all time. Surely it was the good news about Jesus. And he hears it for the first time. He hears it for the first time. I was thinking about this. So it had to be good news. Um, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking of the story. A lot of you have heard it before, so I don't, won't go into detail. But, you know, when mom and dad were in Singapore and, and the church was there, uh, uh, you know that there were a lot of idol temples that were nearby. And um, new people were coming all the time. This was in the 50s, 1950s way back when um, the olden days <laughs> so and uh, a, a woman started coming to church she was a Cantonese speaker D didn't speak any English at all and uh, the church was uh, English Cantonese and she came to church she accepted the Lord she was coming and then one day uh, mom talked with her because uh, mom spoke Cantonese by that time and mom asked her how did you how did you come to Lighthouse uh, how, how did you come? And she said, well, she said, an angel appeared to me one night. Uh, and she was a very devout woman, and she often went to the temples, and she often burned incense. She gave offerings uh, to all of the Chinese gods, to all of them. And you, you sometimes in Hong Kong, we don't think of that many. There are a whole bunch of Chinese gods. And then just in case she had missed, and it wasn't a Chinese god, she also went to the Hindu temple and, and, and gave sacrifices and burned things at, at Hindu temples also. Uh, and just in case, she also went to Buddhist, you know, she went to, she went to, she went to them all. She went to them all because she, she wanted to make sure she got the right God. Um, no joke, her name was Mrs. Fu. And so uh, I guess I am giving you the long version after all, right? And uh, one day she was giving, uh, burning incense, and she looked at all the gods, so, so many, and she thought, these can't all be real. These can't all be true. And so she stood in front of all the idols, and she said, God, what a great prayer. God, whichever one of you is real, would you show me who you are? <laughs> Do you know, if you are searching for truth and you're looking, if you will ask God that sincerely, say, God, would you show me you? I'll, I'll follow you. He'll do that. He'll do that. He'll, he will reveal himself. And so she said, would you, uh, you show me who you are, and if you show me who you are, I will serve you, worship you, you only, nobody else. And went, so that night she was asleep, and an angel appeared to her. Sounds like the book of Acts, doesn't it? It does. And uh, the angel said, go to 1A Kim Cat Road, and there they will tell you about the one true God. And 1A Kim Cat Road was the address of the church. And so she went to 1A Kim Cat Road, and that's where she found out about Jesus. So we look at this. So God's still doing things like that. Um, and the eunuch begins to talk with Philip. It's, it's the same. He was doing the best that he could, and then God sends someone to him. And um, as they rode along... They came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? I, when I read that verse, this reminded me of the Sunday before water baptism when so many of you said, I want to be water baptized. Remember that joyful Sunday when, when people were jumping up and saying, I, I want to be baptized, I want to be baptized. Such a, wonderful, such a wonderful response to the Lord. And um, this says that... Uh, 
he sees there's water, why can't I be baptized? And there was no reason he could not because he had come to believe in Jesus, the one true God, the one who takes away our sins, the one who was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power and went about doing good and making whole all who were oppressed of the enemy. That's what Jesus still does. And so he says, can I be baptized? There was no reason why not. He ordered the carriage to stop. They went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And then I love this verse too. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. Much better than Cathay Pacific. <laughs> much better than Delta. Uh, much better than any airline. The Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. When God works, there's rejoicing. This sounds, this, this sounds just like the Samaritan city, doesn't it? There was great joy in the city when God worked. And so here's God who sends Philip from a great revival with many to one, to one. And in heaven, we will find out the results of that one person. We'll find out the results of that one person. An ordinary person, Philip, just like you, just like you and me, just like you and me, but an extraordinary God, an extraordinary God. We've talked a lot about what God, you know, how God helps us and how the Holy Spirit helps us. But brothers and sisters, I, I want to urge us and encourage us and, and push us to the Holy Spirit wants to anoint us. The Holy Spirit wants to fill us because there are people around us that are really hurt, uh, that need Jesus, that are messed up, that are broken. And sometimes we think the people around us, man, they're such jerks, right? You ever think that, man, they're just such a jerk. A and they are. Do you know why they're jerks? <laughs> because they need Jesus. <laughs> because they need Jesus. Um, and I, just, I want to encourage us. And, I, and uh, next week we're going to look at, and I'm, I'm going to, wow, 11.59. I'm going to stop early today. Um, and then the rest of it, when we look again at next week at Ordinary People, Extraordinary God, we're going to look at some other ordinary people. But I just, I just want to encourage you with that this morning for you yourself, but also, th but also through you. Um, God may be doing great things through you. God may be doing great things around you. Don't be discouraged if God is just working in you to minister to one person. That's still God, and God still has a plan, and God still has a purpose. Next week, we're going to go all the way back and we're going to go to Acts chapter 3. This is right after the... Uh, so you can read Acts 3 and 4 if you want to, if you want a little bit of homework. And we're going to keep talking about uh, ordinary people, extraordinary God. We're going to look at Peter and John when they go up to the temple and God uses them to heal a lame man. But we're going to look at it in a little bit, different, di little bit differently. Let me close with this. I'm, I'm not even, we're not even going to look at the... Uh, let me just give you the title again, Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. So part two next week, and I'll go ahead and let you know. So we're talking about Peter and John and the Extraordinary God, and all, I think some of you sitting here right now are thinking, ordinary people, Peter and John weren't ordinary. They were disciples. I'm, I'm not Peter. I'm not Peter. And you know what? You're not Peter. You're right. You're not Peter. You didn't cut off somebody's ear. Not yet. Thank you, B. <laughs> Would you keep sharp instruments out of her hands, Keith? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. You're a little bit concerned now. Uh, you haven't publicly rebuked Jesus and told him he was saying the wrong thing. You're not Peter. You haven't three times denied Jesus with cursing. Uh, you haven't, just before your Lord and Master went to the cross, you haven't argued about who's the greatest, I'm the greatest. You're right. You're not Peter, and aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Next week, we're going to look at Peter and John, Acts 3 and 4. Ordinary people, extraordinary God. And I promise you, you're going to be encouraged, and you're going to see yourself in this story. 
because it's a Holy Spirit story from beginning to end, and we're part of it. Let's close in prayer. Amen? Amen. 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 Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Amen. Lord, thank you for your, your, your words to us, your, your holy scriptures uh, through which we grow, through which we learn about you, uh, by which we are changed, by which we grow in our faith and in our understanding. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. And uh, God, I, I pray for each one of us. And God, I include myself. God, I know in this church you've done so much for all of us. You've done so much. You have blessed us. Lord, you are, we're not perfect yet, but you're still healing us. You're still putting our parts back together. Lord, we, we know that. You're putting our parts back together. Um, and Lord, I pray for this group that's gathered here this morning that we would not continue looking at all our broken parts and all of our needs, but instead look at you because you're extraordinary. And you can work through us, and you can use broken people that are still being put back together, and you can use imperfection because it's about you and it's not about us. So, Lord, anoint your people with your Holy Spirit and with power. And may they, this week, really, Lord, may they go about doing good as they listen to your Spirit and are led by you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.